Hello, everyone. Are you ready for our first mentor meetup? We've got Sandy C.S. with us today, and I. This, my name is Teresa Cochran. I'm with Engage Art, and I just want to welcome you and um, can be part of our growth as artists. Um, so these folks who've done such an exceptional job give us an opportunity to talk to someone who has more experience than we do often. And um, But each person really has to define for themselves what a mentor is. And over the course of this series, we'll be talking about that. Um, and asking you what you think mentorship is or should be, and to really think about what you might want in a mentorship relationship and what you might be able to give in that kind of relationship. But for today, we are going to, again, be meeting with Sandra Sias, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her right now. Okay, now I believe if I do this, yes. So I'm going to show you some of Sandy's work while I'm reading to you about
So now let's say hello to Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon to wherever you're stopping in from. <laughs> right. It's so nice to see you. And where are you stopping in from today? I'm in Denver, Colorado. We've got a little bit of snow dusting out there, but um, it's a beautiful place to live. Wonderful. And you got some unexpected heavy snow recently, right? Yes, this is yeah. our unpredictable winter. Right. right. Well, I want to just jump right in and ask you some questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to know, just generally, what your advice is for an artist, a Christian artist, young or maybe just starting out, even if they aren't young, um, if they're trying to decide whether they should take sort of a serious go at this art thing, what would you what would you say to them? I think a serious go is an important way to look at it. You know, if God has specifically gifted you in the way of the arts, you can't ignore it. Um, this is the way he's designed us, and we have to pay attention to it somehow. Now, life gets in the way of that, of course, we know that, and sometimes we have to earn a living from different ways to support that, um, but I don't think it should be at all. I think everybody should take it seriously and um, do their best to start working somehow, even if it's only a little bit, even if you only make one piece a year gifts for your family just keep at it because there'll be a day when god will let you know that he wants you to spend more time at it and to trade off some other things in your life so i, th I don't think it should be ignored mm -hmm. that's that's really interesting i'm so let's talk about you and how you got here, okay? So how has your art journey and your faith journey intersected? And sort of which one has impacted the other? Well, <clears throat> with the white hair, you can tell my journey is long, <laughs> um, but I'll kind of try to keep it brief. Um, I did not get the encouragement that I needed as a young person right away. Um, I grew up in the 50s, and um, it was a time where women were encouraged to go to college and not necessarily choose um, a domestic life. Mm -hmm. And my mom was very in support of that with my brothers. And um, But she was afraid that fine art would not give me um, a sustainable uh, future. Mm -hmm. So we, we looked at other alternatives, and I was also uh, very fond of my grandmother, who taught me to sew. So mm -hmm. I was making a lot of apparel at that time, a lot of my own clothes. And so we kind of decided that uh, going into fashion apparel would be a good way to be in the arts, but also able to earn a career. And um, that was true. That was very, very true. As a matter of fact, um, I had an extremely successful 30-year uh, career as an apparel designer. I got to see the world. Um, I could sustain well. I earned a good income. My designs were well received. Um, but then I hit a point where I thought I had had enough, and I really wanted to um, give in to the desires of my heart. I could hear the Lord telling me that um, nothing had been wasted. You know, he was um, had me in a career where I was dealing with people's identities and helping them to see who they were. And he could see that I could probably translate this into fine art to also help people discover themselves and to see um, who God was in the in the experience also. So I went back to school. <laughs> And I got three more degrees. I got a BFA, an MFA, and then I got an MA in religious studies um, because I was um, very uh, confused on how to really blend, you know, my faith with my art. Um, but I trusted that God knew that the timing would occur, you know, that he would bring it together. So I was gifted in um, creativity in a way that I wasn't material driven as a painter or anything. I had trained up in social practice art. Mm -hmm. So I was engaged again with communities and people's identities and cultural identities. Um, so I kept doing this until finally one morning, it was really an, an epiphany. I felt like a two by four hit me in the head and, and God got me out of bed and said, you know what, it's time for you to gather other like members and to really reclaim my voice in the arts because it has been stolen by the secular world. Um, if you look at the art that was winning prizes across the world, um, it was really showing 
who our culture was, which was not the culture that God wants us to be. So um, I reached out to people that I knew and people, they knew people that knew things and a dozen people showed up at my first meeting and we birth um, an artist collective called Christos Collective, which is still in existence today. We're in our eighth year um, and we just support each other. We help each other because it is very hard to know how am I going to be an artist and a faithful person? So we'll talk about Christos a little later because I definitely want to get into that because that's an option for people to join the Christos Collective mm -hmm. and, and have mentorship through that program. So I definitely want to get into that. But this idea of being a faithful person and being an artist, did you, well, let's start with the, the whole fashion design as an intro to the art world. Because of course, high fashion is fine art. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't even look like clothes, right? <laughs> But it, what I'm hearing, I think, is that there's, there's a lot to be learned by doing a um, profession that is tangential to the arts, mm -hmm. especially using art as a, a communication tool. Right. Uh, is that what I'm hearing from you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a communicate. It also had a lot of, I think, my success. Um, was that I had um, a business head about it too, and I could see the psychology involved. Mm -hmm. um, it's just creating visions that people could relate to. And I think um, successfully in the places where I did work and, and bring success to the companies was because you, you need to know how far out you can take your customer or your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, So trying to see where the culture is at which is, um, you know, a spirit of the times. It's, it's just identifying with that and, and seeing how that could affect um, the visual culture. And the visual culture, like you say, is also fashion. It's also advertising and, you know, it's just different things. Like today we can see that advertising has chosen more of, rather than a celebrity, a more relational um, approach. So the visual culture in itself has many industries that um, people could go into to be supportive of their um, fine art practice until they can actually, you know, launch their own fine art. So I know that some of the other folks who have placed in the contest before, one of them, um, gentlemen, makes the designs of the material that are the, on the insides of your car. Oh, <laughs> like the wood dashboard look or something, you know, he designs those, those things, which is wild. Another one, a woman, um, I believe she, she makes the designs for um, the front window of retail. Mm -hmm. And I think she does it for anthropology, you know, mm -hmm. so like there are lots of different ways to make a living mm -hmm. while, working on your expression, working on your skills, you know, and being able to really um, sink into visual language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. You know, um, I think a lot of people, I mean, even as an apparel designer, I when I started moving out of uh, the central cities for apparel, such as New York City and San Francisco and, and came into the middle of Denver, well, there was Western wear here. But I also went into baby products and um, health aids. And, and like, like you said, I was designing fabrics and, to go on baby strollers and telling them that they don't have to be just pink and blue, you know, that the, the visual culture is ready for something a little more dynamic. And um, that became a successful. Also. So, yes, there are lots of ways to um, stay within a creative venue and, um, you know, develop skills. Develop your psychological skills and your, you know, anthropology of what's going on in the culture, etc. That's really great. Well, you've had, you've done so many different things. And I've got to tell you, I'm just enchanted with some of your installation work and some of the work that you do with communities. But I'm curious about when in this journey you have felt most fulfilled. Mm. Well, I, I did enjoy the cultural immersion um, because you could see that um, the visuals of a creative encounter um, brings people together. You know, it's a community builder. Um, 
COVID put a halt to that for me. And then it drove me more internal into my studio. So I started painting um, and I'm doing more paintings now. And of course, at my age and my family dynamics, it's not as easy to take off as much as I used to. But one of the most fulfilling things would be is being in community. Um, I, I worked in Juarez with a group of students. I've been in India with a group of students, and we would work with the visual arts into cultures of sex trafficking and um, cartel, you know, avoiding cartels and children coming out in the streets. I worked in Spain during um, our uprising there when there was the conflict be between Barcelona and the southern Spain uh, regions. Mm -hmm. And um, I was asked to do something out in the public to draw the public out because they weren't talking to each other. And I did a land art piece that um, brought children out first. Children are unafraid. Um, and I really couldn't speak the language either, but it was quite fulfilling to see all these children come out and help me. They were bringing me gifts of nature to put into this land art. And then eventually their parents came out and the parents hung out together. And um, so I think art has a kind of a power to build community. And this is what I taught at the Colorado State University was, you know, community building through the arts and event planning. And so it, that was fulfilling to me. And I think now, now that I'm painting and in more 2D work than so much public intervention or installation, that um, it's just a different process. It's a little deeper, intimate um, expression or narration, you know, narrating. And um, I think my greatest pleasure or reward is when someone looks at a piece that I've created that has my heart and soul in it, that they actually you know, take a deep breath and don't say much at first and just say, wow, there's something in that that, we, you know, I can relate to. And that's, that's, I think artists love that feeling, you know. I'm thinking about the land art piece you did. And I'm, if it's the one I'm thinking about it, it was sort of circular and had a lot of, of um, nature aspects to it. And you were sort of placing it together. Mm -hmm. We have a similar exercise that we put together um, to do a mandala, a nature mandala. Mm -hmm. These sorts of, of things that can be collaborative and can feed from the different aspects of a culture, they do, they do really bring people together and people want to participate. Um, and my husband is a public artist. And one of the things he says a lot is that it doesn't matter if a piece, if you like a piece of public art, um, or you were, or how you relate to it. If it's in your space, you relate to it, mm -hmm. and everybody's relating to it. So whether you like it or not, you have something to have a conversation about. Mm -hmm. right? It brings you together by the act of being in your space, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. And and the kids, they can't help; they flock, you know. <laughs> So as we try to get out again, I, I hope that artists will poke out of their comfort zone a little bit and try some of these things, like take some chalk, go draw on the sidewalk and see who helps. You know, like that's part of how we can, can help people start to relate again. I think too, um, I'm of a, a process artist also. I really enjoy um, the spontaneity or the surprises of what comes in an art. And I like my art to um, embed the process to be part of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And when you do something, as you know, you know, in public art or community building, you don't have control of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to have control of how to control when things are out of control. If you can understand that. It's like you, you have to be willing to be open to the spontaneity, but you've got to have the confidence that you can control the boundaries of that. And um, beautiful things happen in that. I mean, I had no idea what that piece would have looked like in Spain, nor in Juarez when we were doing, um, we were working on the bus stops. We had the kids painting rocks and we were making mosaics and stuff. Yeah. So the, having that openness creates not only the community, but, but it creates the collaboration that makes um, the final piece, you know, more spirited. So you're sort of giving them a framework within, mm -hmm. within to work. So, you know, you're making a mosaics, but you're having them paint the rocks. Yes. That's their job. So that helps you keep it from going out of control. 
Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. that we haven't had out of control things too. <laughs> There's okay. been beautiful out of control things. And we and as artists, those of you that are listening, you know in our studio we always can't control everything. And some of the surprises are, are just wonderful things to embrace. So yes. <laughs> so I I'm curious about your take on how important um, it is to know about art. Um, mm -hmm. Like how some people become artists, but they never study art history and they don't know um, sort of where their references are coming from even. And I'm, I'm curious about your feeling about the value and importance of understanding the history of art. Um, I'm a real advocate of um, education. <clears throat> I think it's um, it's more than just the facts that you're learning. It's the, it's, it's the community of being with other like-minded creatives that challenge you and push you further. Um, even in the apparel industry, I started, <clears throat> excuse me, teaching right away at the college level. That that was where I felt most comfortable. And I was teaching fashion design and draping and marketing and, you know, research and stuff like that. And then when I got into fine arts, I also started teaching that in, at several universities. I've been kind of what's called an independent professor so that I'd have control of my own schedule. But I, I really think education um, gives you greater tools. It's not that if you're gifted by the Lord that you're not skilled. You are skilled. But as I said, to be beyond just skilled um, is being aware. And being aware is knowing, you know, who the audience is in the art world, who's um, succeeding, <clears throat> why are they succeeding, <clears throat> excuse me, do you want to be similar to them or do you want to counteract them? Such as now, I think we need to counteract a lot of the art that's out there with the right spirit of culture. But um, education helps you get there. I mean, mm -hmm. I did not hesitate going back to get a, another bachelor's and then a master's and another master's. Um, again, like I said, it's not only the community and facts, it's the uh, <clears throat> pushing of making you try new things and to try it in community that's safe where you're learning the entire time. Now, I guess some people can be genius right from the start and that's wonderful mm -hmm. too. Um, but there's something precious in um, learning. I, I mean, I consider myself definitely a life learner. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like there's a sort of separation between up in your skills, like, like learning taking lessons in drawing or sculpture or your actual craft uh, versus the academic piece? Or do you find them to, to really feed each other? I, I believe they feed each other. <clears throat> and, but I do think I'm, I'm not a, um, a pure genre artist. I mean, I don't just paint. <clears throat> My pure genre is communicating, communicating um, a cultural need, you know, um, from a uh, voice. So medium is um, open to me. I mean, I will use anything that I can think of that works to communicate the story. Now, mm -hmm. some people stick with the same genre the entire way and <clears throat> learning those skills becomes with practice you know, become better at it. I mean, I'm better at painting now, even though I never schooled in painting, I was more schooled in sculpture. So mm -hmm. the hand touch or the 3D was easier for me. But um, I teach drawing in, um, in various dry mediums and now a little bit of wet medium. So um, I'm starting to learn from myself. You know? <laughs> I'm always learning, you know, and you're experimenting. Well, and, and one of the things that really shines through in your work is the conceptual complexity, yes. simplicity and complexity, um, but conceptual piece, which I, I think also, you know, some people are born being deep, um, but most people are not. Most people um, are educated into being able to understand those things more deeply. But, but here's a question. <clears throat> Talent versus effort, talent versus effort. What's your take on that? Um, I think if you recognize that God has gifted you with talent, mm -hmm. that it is, it is your responsibility 
and you're to be accountable to that, that you have to nurture it. Um, and that's where education can come in. You need, you need to uh, practice it so that it's growing. It's like if you've seen the seed of something, you want to, you know, cultivate it. So um, I think that's really important to dedicate your time or it's actual time in the studio or experimenting or working with other artists. That makes me want to go back to um, the pr previous question, too, about uh, knowing other famous artists. Um, I can remember being in school and thinking, oh, I'll never know all these names. But <laughs> eventually it becomes critical because you're, you want to, you're going to be um, communicating through your art into a narrative of what is culture and how you want people to see us as a unified humanity, then um, you need to know what other people before you have done yeah. and who have succeeded at it. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy uh, not only looking, and I've seen a lot of original art in person and just been stunned and awed into silence to contemplate and put myself in their shoes to see why they created what they did. And um, that experience in itself is, is enormously important to get your own voice, to find your own claiming of your own voice. So knowing why other people did what they did and uh, researching them, I would want people to do that about me. You know, if, if um, they see a piece of work that they, they, they feel that resonates with them and they, they want it in their home or they want to be remembering it all the time and thinking about the narrative behind it, I want them to know who I am because that's my opportunity to witness. I mean, I am a creation from God. Um, I have a voice that he's given me and he's gifted to me and he wants me to speak through it. And um, if people don't reach out to find out who I am, they may not get to know him as quickly. So I think it's a really important um, step in your career to, to um, bring that all together. That's really interesting because, I mean, the, the general sweep of art history is that, you know, there's a, a movement and then there's a movement that knocks it out, you know, that is counter mm -hmm. and that goes back and forth and in all different directions. But if you don't understand the mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know, this happened because they didn't like this. Mm -hmm. right? This pushed this out. Then you don't know what the um, what the sort of subconscious things are that are that are influencing your art. Right. Like you don't know how you get where you get to. Um, but but this idea about seeing art in person so different, right? Mm -hmm. To, to have you can have a, a reproduction on your wall for years that you love and you go and you see the original for the first time and it it's a whole different experience you you don't know it until you've seen the original at least that's been my experience and and no and as an artist to artist too when you see an original you as I said you, you step into their shoes and you can see the enormous um effort that was placed into it. Um, I'm writing a book now, Teresa, on, um, I'm writing a book on how the arts have a powerful voice in, in uh, crafting culture you know, and how culture crafts art. We all know that as artists, but there's a, if you can um, step into that space to recognize that exchange or that relationship, mm -hmm. then you realize that we're all connected. And, we're, and, you know, and I, and I go into the golden mean and the Fibonacci series and all the universal laws that hold us together in, in, in um, a beautiful encapsule that God created. Um, and in this book, not only am I trying to bring the reader to understand that they are a micro piece in a huge macro um, harmony that we're all tuned into, um, is a, a section on essays where I'm writing about seeing art in person, how important that is, how it, it, it can, um, it can, as um, she, Tolstoy would say, it infects you. <laughs> That's great. It, it infects you so that it's all throughout your body. So um, I'm in that section of the book, I'm talking about how, when I first saw, um, you know, a, uh, June Kaneko's ceramic work, how it made me dance. I mean, I physically, you know, lifted my arms and how the first time I saw Brancusi's work, um, you know, and some works, oh, the Pieta, and when I saw that in St. Petersburg, oh, it's just the, um, 
it made me cry. So, you know, this is important as an artist to have these personal experiences so that when people experience your work, that you build it to do the same thing. We had um, an artwork we did in St. Louis at the Regional Arts Commission there, and it actually pierces the wall, and it's a glass artwork, and it's um, got, it, it's different from inside and outside, but on the outside, we have the words um, that we collected from people on the street, and the question was, tell us about an unforgettable experience with an artwork or an artist and I'm telling you people walking down the street they knew they knew when it was that they had been really impacted by a musician or so many people said that David like that was the sculpture that went to the top it was so interesting and so interesting to put those words together but yet it has a huge impact but this book um, how far are you? When can we expect it? What's it called? Do you have a publisher? Well, I'm into chapter four and I'm planning five chapters. So I'm quite a, quite a ways on it. I, I got to have my first reading soon uh, within this first quarter of the year. Um, I would suspect I'm probably done drafting by the end of the summer. <laughs> and hopefully have enough readers this year that I can publish next year. So um, if it goes faster, maybe it's my first. So I'm not sure um, how that totally works, but um, I felt God calling me. It was, um, you know, I'm a real um, strong dot connector. You mm -hmm. know, when you were a kid, you connected these dots to create things. Um, I'm dyslexic also. So my brain is a very visually stimulated to connect things. And um, in this book, I feel like I'm doing that. I'm, I'm citing an, a lot of um, knowledge that we know, but we may have not connected. And yeah. that, that's my aim in the book is to have everyone go, aha, yes, yes, I do know that. But boy, if I connect it all to this, um, I am just so much more valuable in God's eyes. I'm more valuable in humanity. My gifts are really important to share. You know, yeah. so I'm excited about it. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to tell you the name yet. I'm thinking okay. it's, it's, real, it's real mysterious. Um, and I intended it to be that way. But, you know, sometimes things change. So I'd have to see on that. Here's my ask. Can we get an abstract as a blog when you're ready to publish? Oh, I'm unaware of that. So I'll have to reach out to you to see how to do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So that the audience can get a teaser, you know. And oh, I do have my abstract. Oh, yes, I do have my abstract written. And of course, um, I'm sure writers probably know this, that you go back to, after you've written the whole book and you've had your own experience like creating a work of art. It is a work of art. It is. <laughs> um, I'll probably go back and um, re redraft the abstract. But um, you heard my motive. You know, so my, my, my motive is such. And um, I'm a believer that there's a... Um, is what I call a, 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 a tone, mm -hmm. you know, like a rhythmic beat in the universe. That's God's breath. And it unites us all. And um, we, when we become aware of that, we become more aware of the world we're living in and how um, to relate to it, how to be within the world in a way that um, you're meaningful and you're unique. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So um, we have you here today as a mentor, and I want to ask you about mentorship. Um, okay. Has that been important in your life for yourself? Have you had mentors and how did you choose them and how did you, what did you get out of that relationship? And then as a mentor, what do you get out of being a mentor? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. I mean, I find mentor, mentoring being part of education. So uh, even within the institutions in which I taught, we would have mentoring kinds of um, examples or, you know, partnerships and stuff. And I think in the collective that I've founded too, mentoring is important to share. And mentoring is not dictating. It's more of a sharing. I mean, even in education and teaching, I think I was um, a popular teacher because I had um, a philosophy of um, equal exchange you know, and willingness to contextualize 
what a young person was bringing to me and the knowledge that I had from history and to try to see if there's even a new way to look at something. That's fine. I mean, having taught for over 40 years, I can see that we move from a vertical delivery to a horizontal uh, delivery in education today because everything's at our fingertips. So we have to adjust. So I think mentoring is a lot the same. And when I think of my mentors, they were mostly my professors um, at first because I was in education for a long time. They were always available. That's a key thing about mentoring is being available and recognizing that you can set boundaries on that. It doesn't make it hard. I'm right now about the eight, eight minute phone call, if you read the map. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's something to uh, brevity <laughs> to uh, make things successful. And we're all pretty attuned to what we want to know, too. So our questions are far more direct. And um, we should tell people who don't know about that, what that eight minute phone call thing is. I'll let you do that. <laughs> It's just this um, this idea that we put off having interactions with people because we're afraid it's going to be too much of a burden or too much of an investment, and we, we can't fit that in. So um, I can't remember who it was, came up with this idea that uh, I thought it was seven minutes, but it might be eight minutes. Oh, yeah. We can have a, an eight-minute conversation, and and that can be it. Like we can agree ahead of time. I would like to talk to you for eight minutes at this time and we can do that. And it's enough time to get caught up and give some more information and have an exchange and then say, that was great eight minutes. I'll see you later. Right. <laughs> and, and be happy that it's over. You don't, you're not yeah. investing hours. You don't need to go someplace and, and have this big investment. You can have an eight minute phone call and have made that connection. So I probably didn't do that justice, but go well, ahead. That's perfectly fine. And I, and I think mentoring, um, if you're a good mentor too, which I've had good mentors, they know how to set those um, parameters. You know, it's like, okay, that, that, those are good questions. And now go out and do some research on this. You know, the mentor isn't meant to uh, give you all the answers. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually, I think a really good mentor answers your questions, but also, um, if they answer two questions, they want to give you four, four um, new ones, you know, to go ask. So um, it's important to have that growth always, always growing in what's next and what can you be thinking of next. And, and I've had really good mentors like that. I've had mentors also that tap into your um, kind of when you feel like you're losing confidence that a good mentor can can point out because a lot of times we get close to ourselves in our progress and we don't realize we've accomplished a lot more than we think we have and a mentor is really good at saying no no stop for a minute here you've done this this this, and this this is really productive so just get back on the track and find which ladder you know which rung on the ladder you're at and keep going you know so that kind of encouragement is really important uh, as a mentor too I mean I love it when my students ask me questions too that I don't know yeah. you know and I say okay let's explore this together and then again, in our next eight minutes, we'll get together <laughs> and see what we each found, because I think there's so much more today to discover uh, than oh uh, what was written in the Britannica or something. Right. <laughs> it's, you know, not, not that we want to be in a Wikipedia world, but we want to, you know, be open to that's where innovation comes in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at AI studies. Oh, now. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> And I'm reading an excellent book on that about how um, people feel threatened, you know, mm -hmm. by the processing. But we all know that we've used technology to just move us quicker. And sometimes that's not always better, but it does um, help us to take more, a little more responsibility about what creativity is, you yeah. know, by using tools with responsibility and accountability. So, um, I, I have, I've really embraced it. I'm not one of the ones that oppose those things. I think that they're, they're aids. Um, God created brains that created them just as we created beauty in, um, in our arts or conversations in our arts. So we just need to find ways to partner and find the boundaries. Um, it's quite clear that no machine um, is going to outdo God's creation. So oh, as a human. Yes. Absolutely not. Um, we're having this conversation at our house too, and and we're all sort of coming down in different places. But we've played with it a lot, mm -hmm. and one of us is like, "Look at all the mistakes!" <laughs> you know, like if people take this as gospel, you know, there's too many mistakes here, and people are going to come away with the wrong 
the wrong idea. And then somebody else is saying that, um, well, it gives you a good outline. You know, mm-hmm. it gives you like the basic information and without a slant. And that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, they're going to have to get a lot better before we can count on them. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think that's where the innovation comes in is, you know, seeing what's in the gaps, how mm-hmm. to connect the dots, how to take it out of the parameters that were programmed. You yeah. know, um, I mean, this book uses the term out of the box, which I think is real cliche and trite, yeah. but we got to find a new way to say that maybe out of the robot, but <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about the Christos Collective, because that is a formalized program that you have created and nurtured over time that people can take part in that has mentorship as a a portion of it. So can you really give us a a good outline of what Christos Collective is and how people can engage with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said earlier... Christos Collected um, started eight years ago, and we were just a community of artists, about a dozen of us coming together and trying to share um, where in the process we were to becoming a little more professional and encouraging each other. So we mentored each other kind of in a community group sense. Mm -hmm. And through the years, we started to realize that we are all growing. We're expanding. People would come and go. Mm -hmm. And... um, I saw a need to get a little more formalized. So we went nonprofit. We are a 501 C three, so we can accept tax deductible donations. Um, our artists do donate to the, uh, organization and it goes into a scholarship fund where we scholarship back to the artists, uh, in what we call a cultivation program. That's our main mission is to cultivate artists of faith to go out and be part of the culture through their art to bring people to Christ. So we, we really feel like that um, we need to become respected in our voices and our art needs to be at excellence. We have critiques all the time. We have many opportunities to exhibit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do leasing programs for office spaces. We mm-hmm. do sales to new uh, places that buy a dozen pieces of our artist art to put into their, their office space or their community space. Mm-hmm. Um, we just want our our artists to continue to make work. We encourage each other to do that. Sometimes I'll step out, which we're doing this March. We'll, we uh, have enough funds to purchase what's called vanity space in a secular uh, district of uh, Denver in the art district. And we're doing an exhibition based on salt. You know, the salt of the earth or just salt, 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 salt. There's so many, so many beautiful stories around that. And the artists are inspired and uh, producing all kinds of materials to do this. And um, we'll be uh, debuting that show in March um, into a secular culture where we want people to um, love the art, number one, and then question it. It gives mm-hmm. us a platform. You know, we, we highly consider that our art is our testimony. Mm-hmm. That's our tagline. So artists, we just went national this year. So we have a Zoom meeting the third Thursday uh, mm-hmm. every month at uh, in the evening. And then we have local meetings um, on the second Saturday in the morning. And um, we gather to critique, to talk about exhibitions coming up. We exhibit at churches and universities quite mm-hmm. frequently. We do panels where mm-hmm. we educate the public on the uh, value of this kind of art and how important it is to uh, support it. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed is sometimes the Christos Collective will work together on a piece um, that will be uh, on something that is used as a collective to exhibit together at least, right? Yeah, we 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 started with one on Fruit of the Spirit. So there were nine artists, nine months, and um, we passed around 18 by 18 inch depth, you know, uh, gallery wrapped canvases and mm-hmm. everybody added something to the story. We had a journal traveling with it so that you could journal your reasons for why you created patience the way you did. So there was layer upon layer of mm-hmm. um, various art artists techniques and visions and and messages they are beautiful this uh fruit of the spirit collection is probably four years old we've Mm -hmm. exhibited numerous universities we're scheduled to uh, ship it to indiana 
uh, to a mutual friend of ours, um, uh, Indiana University, West Leyland, and that in the fall we'll go there. And now we've started another collaborative piece on um, the seven days of creation. So that's in process now. So you can Instagram us at Christos Collective and um, kind of follow that because the person uh, managing that will post some of the, and sometimes uh, you can uh, go to ChristosCollective.org to see our website to get to know um, and see all the shows we've done, all the artists that are in the group, there's profiles on them. And um, we have a newsletter that comes out every month, um, which is always fun to read. So um, I welcome everybody to do that. And uh, if you're interested in joining um, on the national level, please just reach out to uh, christoscollective at gmail.com and we'll reach back out to you and get you hooked up. So. I'm going to look at some of these um, comments. I have been negligent and not looking at comments. It looks like there were some problems with the sound at the beginning, but I, I assume that has resolved because we've got lots more comments. <laughs> so um, uh, Renika is saying, so good to see Sandra. Yes, children are bold and help bringing people together along with art. And it looks like... Um, Sydney Gage. So this is a lot of Renika. Sherry Barrera is there. Um, looking out for writing the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's mostly, I think, Renika talking. I have some in Christos Collective. It has been a source of fellowship, knowledge, and encouragement on my art journey. I'm not sure who that is, but... Hi, Leon. Hi, Leon. Thanks for being here, sir. That's really great. So let me see what else I have here. Um, do so. Are there qualifications to become part of the Christos Collective? Mostly, um, the spirit. You have to agree with the spiritual statement that's on the website. We want to make sure that we have um, a like mind on yes. why we we believe in what we believe and why we're doing what we're doing. And um, We've had, you know, in eight years, I mean, I have a studio class where I teach where I have students that have been with me for eight years. You grow oh. quite a bit. Um, Absolutely. I think the artwork that we're making now is outstanding, but don't let that scare you away if you're just getting back into it, because we that's what we're here for, to cultivate. If you're still at the seedling point, um, we welcome you, you know, and, and we will push you and pull you and support you. Um. Oh, look at that. Renika must be back here with us because I didn't make that happen. Um, <laughs> so I, Sandy, I asked you, well, first of all, before we go to your favorite scripture, I wanted to just say, is, is there anything else that you want to tell people? I mean, we're just so privileged to have you here and you giving so generously of your time um, to to reach out to people in this way. We've, un, I, I personally have just really enjoyed going through your work to be able to present you this, this month as our featured artist and the salt pieces. Oh, I am in love with those salt pieces because everybody, she's using salt. It's not, we're not like drawing salt. You know, we're not drawing pillars. We are using salt as a me as an art medium. And oh my goodness, I'm just I am it's great. I really, really love it. Um so but is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you want to talk about or I think I just want to reiterate, you know, um not to ignore um mm -hmm. the artistic gift. If God's given it to you, um Start using it, even if it's even if your life is very full. I mean, we all go through seasons where that takes away, but don't allow it to. There are there are ways you can just be sketching in sketchbooks. That whole funny series I did with the little tiny rolls of paper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I call repetition. That was during a time where I knew I couldn't get in my studio. So I sat in front of the TV with my family and just rolled these magazine pages and filled boxes upon boxes. So you can always be creating, um, even walking in nature or walking. Use your eyes. Um, I call it, oh, I like this. I call it the studio of my mind. When I can't get into the studio physically, I want to go into the studio of my mind. And you can do that anywhere. 
You can do it with your eyes open or you can do it with your eyes closed. And I even think of some pieces that I've created. They've been in my mind for over 10 years. Wow. There's nothing wrong with that. The mm -hmm. right time will occur. I mean, I have a wooden piece on racism that um, took 10 years. And then finally, after George Floyd, it was like, it is time yeah. to make this. And God nudged me. I made it. It has sold. It has been uh, photographed in numerous um, uh, activism mm -hmm. websites and stuff to be shared. Um, it's just a poetic rendering of being in unity, one with one another, one flesh. So um, I can't, I don't think you can ignore the nudges. If you're in a relationship with the Lord, he'll nudge you. He'll know. He'll tell you. Just do something. Always be creating <laughs> something. <laughs> Even if it's with your children. Yeah. Be ready to answer the call, right? To, yeah. to not push away those nudges, that inspiration. And I really hear where you, unlike a lot of Christian artists who um, may have Christian themes in their art or may have certain symbolism, often private symbolism, um, you are very overt about having your art be a way to bring people to Christ. And that's part, you know, even part of what Christos Collective, what was the tagline? Art is our testimony. Art is our testimony. Yeah. Is our testimony. So you're very overt about that. And, and that is, is different than a lot of artists. Has that been a, a conscious choice on your part? Yes, I, I do think it is. And I, and we do encourage each other to not be um, so iconic or didactic. You know, because then, you know, that was the Roman era. We're not living in the Roman era. So, in, you know, in a meta modern, I call it, we're way past post. Um, in a meta modern, you, you need to be aware of what's going on right now in culture. And you can still speak through those materials or those um, visions mm -hmm. in a way. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a conversation with culture. It's a conversation with culture and redirecting it. Yeah. You know, so that and that's where we um, cultivate each other, you know, because a lot of Christian artists. Yes. And we get people who find us on the website who say, wow, you guys are contemporary artists. And that's important to us to yeah. be have God's voice in a contemporary presentation, right. not necessary, um, you know, something that's been done history over over and over throughout history. I mean, we can always put a twist on it that bring it into the, the time of the spirit of the time. Yeah. Agreed. That's really exciting. I'm, I'm so excited to see where Christos Collective goes. Um, so again, thank you, Sandy, for your generosity. I am going to put up here if I, here I am. Okay. I'm going to take us off the stream and put up, well, put up your favorite um, verse. Would you like to uh, recite or read it for us? Sure. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then I would fly away and be at rest. So beautiful. Psalm 55, 6. I love that. I love that. Have you ever made artwork on that? I have an underground anonymous street art project that has been in existence since 2006 based on this. Oh. So how many years is that? <laughs> ah, 6, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh -huh. And if you want to explore it, those of you that are privileged to be here today, then um, Google Blessing Doves or www.blessingdoves.org. Since I have been blessed and privileged to travel the world quite a bit, um, pre-COVID. Um, these doves that I make by hand have been gifted around the world, and there are volunteers that help me do this. Um, it's an anonymous project, a street art intervention project um, that I probably will do until I die and go to rest. Ugh. That is so wonderful. I am going to be looking that up. Um, so, Sandy, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to put you backstage again and just wrap up for everybody. But we so appreciate you and um, are so thankful for your friendship and for your mentorship. Thank you, Teresa, for inviting me to this. And I couldn't see all of you out there, but uh, thank you for taking the time um, to spend some time with me just chatting and learning.
Yeah, it's wonderful. Bye-bye. And then what I want to do, guys, is say thanks for hanging out with us today. Um, you can come see Engage Art in lots of different places. Visit our website. We've got a huge gallery full of art made by folks who are responding to scripture. You can read what they're talking about or what they're thinking while they're making their work and see the work itself in all forms, um, all forms of visual art, including video, music video, anything that has a visual component. We have a Facebook group that you um, may be part of. We have a Facebook page that you may be part of. The page is particularly active with other artists of faith. Um, we also have an app that helps you to have scripture in your life every single day. There's all sorts of great research about why that makes your life better, how it makes your life better. And we would love to have you as part of our app, which not only gives you scripture every day, but gives you ways to dive deeper into some other um into some engaged art content, some art faith content. Every single last Tuesday of the month, we have a Bible cluster. Sandy is going to be on our Bible cluster this month, January 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, every second Friday at noon, you can meet with Renika on Facebook for prayer. Really wonderful. Uh, we have these mentor meetups that we're just starting, and they're going to be the next to the last Monday at noon on Facebook Live. It's a little harder to remember, but we'll figure it out at some point. If you're really interested in seeing more of Sandy's work, um, she has a website, sandrachincias.com. On Facebook, she's sandra.cias. And on Instagram, she is sjcias. So, check her out. She is really, really awesome, as you could tell um, here with us today. So let's see, is there anything else that we need to, well, also just to remind you, the Christos Collective, you can go find out about it at christoscollective.org. The membership is very low cost, and they're doing really great work and fantastic mentorship happening there. So be as we sign off today, I just want to say thanks for coming. We appreciate you. We hope that you are finding places to mentor others and to find mentorship in your life. And we hope that somehow today you will engage culture, engage scripture, and engage art. Bye-bye.